Looks like we're live on my screen now. All right. Hey, everybody. It's Dave with DII. Uh, we have a live show with you to, uh, for you today, which uh, featuring Jeremy Arndt. It's going to be really great. He's a wonderful guest. He's got a lot to offer as far as knowledge in the handpan, meditation, yoga, all sorts of fun stuff, including sound healing, etc., etc. He's got a ton of stories, lots of experience, so it's going to be a great interview. I'm going to really enjoy uh, talking with him about those subjects. Um, first and foremost, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please hit the red subscribe button below the screen. Uh, it'd be great to have you as a subscriber. Um, also, if you haven't been to our website, it's davesislandinstruments.com. Uh, if you want to become a, a subscriber to our email um, newsletter, go down to the bottom of the home page and you can register at the bottom of the home page there. That'd be great to have you on our email list as well. All right, I'm David Beery. I'm the owner of DII. I've been making hand pans for about 12 years now. And uh, before that, I made steel drums for about, I don't know, 10 or 15 more years <laughs> before that. So I've been doing this tuning stuff for a long time. It's a lot of fun, and I'm really uh, glad to be here with you today. All right, with no further ado, I'm going to bring Jer Jeremy Arndt on screen with me, and we're going to talk about some fun stuff. Here we go. Jeremy, there you are. Hello, everybody. <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. By the way, uh, before we start a discussion, anybody out there watching, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comments section. And hopefully I'll be able to see them and perhaps bring them on screen for us to, to have a discussion about. So uh, if you do have anything to say, just put it in the comments section and hopefully we'll see it and uh, get your questions answered. Awesome. Jeremy, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, I've got some really fun uh, questions for you because I've, I've uh, seen you a couple times over the years, uh, but I've never really, like, I wouldn't say I've hung out at, uh, at your house for breakfast or anything. So, yeah. so I've known you and I've been following you on Facebook a lot for years now, and it's really kind of fun. You've got all sorts of uh, amazing hand pan adventures that I'd love to discuss today. So uh, first and foremost, our motive, most of the people that are watching are usually beginners or hand pan, uh, people that are really just interested in hand pan, uh, but they might not have been playing for a long time. So I just want to touch on a lot of the basics uh, and uh, some of the basic things that you've experienced so you can kind of get people up to speed with uh, how you got started, where you've moved ahead with the hand pan, that sort of thing. So the first question I have for you is when was the first time you became aware of hand pans and when was the, what was the first one that you got or that whole experience? Okay, <clears throat> uh, so I don't remember exactly the year, um, but the first time I discovered the hand pan was, you know, I was perusing some YouTube videos and one popped up in the little sidebar it said amazing street musician and I was actually watching videos of street musicians um, because I wanted to start traveling and playing music in the streets yeah. at that time it was my guitar and when I clicked on it um, you know my jaw just dropped and I was blown away just like a lot of a lot of the rest of us the first time we hear it and I, I was like, oh yeah, that's that's my instrument. I don't yeah. know what it is, but that's my instrument. So you know, I started a little quest to to find what it was, um, and then was pretty discouraged when I found out that oh, this is only made by two people in <laughs> Switzerland, and right. you have to write a letter, and you know, it's really hard to get it. Well, um, sorry, what 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 was the year? Do you remember the year about? So. It was, let's see, the year I got my first hand pan was 2000 and um, probably 2009. Okay. Maybe 2010. Yeah. And it was like, it was almost three years before that. So, okay. Um, so it was like 2007, 2008. That's pretty early. 2007, yeah. probably, yeah. Yeah, because hand pans were only created and started to be sold around the year 2000. So that yeah. would have been around seven years after that, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the way I, I kind of see it is there's like, there's like the first generation of people that found the Hung early right. on, and I found it like right on the cusp of when uh, hand pans were like being developed. It, it wasn't long after I discovered it that Pantheon Steel was like, you know, posting on the forums, uh, I think it was called the Hang Music Forum at okay. the time, that, hey, we're going to be making this. Uh, this new instrument and you know 
and that was when I got on the waiting list uh, for a, a Pantheon instrument. Got it. Okay. 176 or something like that. You know, at the, at the time, um, they had an email waiting list first, and then it was like, okay, if you put a deposit, you can get in the first 250 instruments. And I didn't have the money right away. I think it was like, you know, a month or two uh, after they announced that, that I got the money for a deposit. Yeah. I was just out of just out of college and pretty broke back then and um so i think it was like a 150 dollar deposit it wasn't or 300 dollars. it wasn't you know that much in the grand scheme of things but i didn't have it at the time so i was a little bit worried but i was able to get in on the first batch number 170 something and uh you know then it took a while for my instrument to be built yeah i got my instrument in 2000 I think it was 2009. It's kind of That sounds about right. Yeah. 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 You know, it, my sideline comment on that is uh, Pantheon Steel is uh, the owner is Kyle. And uh, Kyle made steel drums before he was making hand pans too. So similar to myself. And I'll never forget, he called me up one time because I, I was buying some barrels from him or something like that uh, a few years back in the early 2000s. And he said, Dave, I just want to let you know I'm going to transfer over and I'm going to stop making steel drums and I'm going to make this new thing. It's called a hand pan. And I'm like, cool, okay. And at the, you know, I didn't know what he was talking about at the time, but now it all becomes clear you know, afterwards what, what kind of decision he decided to make. And I think it was a good decision on his part. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely became you know, one of the pioneers of, of what we know as a hand pan today. Yeah, you know? yeah he got in early. Very nice. So you also have a, a history with um, yoga and sound healing. So um, when beginners here, oh, here's another question I have, another, another beginner question. So when you first got your hand pan, uh, how long did it take you to kind of warm up to the instrument? Did it take you a while to like to get the t uh, touch and the feel for it? Or did you have anybody yeah. that was helping you? Or how did that go? Yeah, at the time, uh, you know, when I got my first hand pan, it was, it was basically the first time I put my hands on a hand pan. I think a week before, uh, a guy that I knew let me try his hung. Okay. But he didn't. He didn't let anybody try his his hung back then. You know, he was like, he uh, he was very protective of it. Yeah. And uh, so you know, it wasn't until about a week before I got my instrument that he was like, "Yeah, you can you can try this out." But um, yeah, it took longer than I expected. You right. Know, I, I've you watch the videos and it looks like it should be instantaneous you yeah. know you're and uh but it, it took a few days just to get the touch down you know i have a video on youtube on my channel uh of the second day i had the instrument and you can tell like looking at that versus now you know there was oh, sure some, there was definitely some awkwardness in the playing and oh yeah um you know and then it's what I call passionate persistence. You know, the more you pursue it, the more each time you pick it up, you get a little bit better, even if it doesn't, uh, you know, even if it doesn't show in that playing session. So. Right, right. You know, it's interesting. You got in on it so early that um, a lot of the playing techniques, I would say, have been developed on handpan, you know, within the last 10 years. There's a lot of stuff that I remember seeing people play you know in the early when well, I got involved right around 2009 2010 and some of those techniques like just getting harmonics and that sort of thing was just being developed so uh, I think it's fascinating you kind of probably got in on some of that as well like do you remember uh, when certain techniques were developed or like watching somebody else and going oh I've never seen that before yeah well you know one of the first videos that had a lot of like uh, technical playing i guess that i would remember is uh manu de lagos oh, yeah. uh, manu, manu, De manu desire um piece that he did and he was like sitting on his couch and he's playing all the harmonics and everything and at that time you know not a lot of people really knew what was going on you know in his hands and um so that was my first um introduction to different techniques i guess and yeah you know, and then like Dante and um, um, players like that coming along. You know, I'm not the most technical player. I can I can play harmonics and stuff, but I don't generally uh, incorporate them with my music. Okay, cool. Often, so, yeah. Um, it's just uh, 
yeah, it's uh, something that I never uh, felt called to pursue myself. You know, yeah. you can go as deep as you want with the instrument or with techniques. And, and so there's players that are really mind blowing that are completely technical. And then there's players that mix like, you know, the technicalities with, uh, you know, more melodic playing or rhythmic playing. And, um, you know, I, I approach it more from like a melodic and um, perspective, I guess. Melodic yeah, playing. no, that's actually a great lead in to my question about yoga and meditation and sound healing and that sort of thing. So uh, I know that when you are involved with uh, I've only done I've only personally ever played for one yoga class. So I have very limited uh, experience with that. Uh, but I'm sure you probably play differently for a yoga class or a sound healing than you do on a street corner, right? Definitely. Yeah. So, so how do you structure it? Like when you're playing for a sound healing class or for your yoga class, it like, give me your little insight in like how you would structure that in your brain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, for me, when I started playing in yoga classes, I was also a yoga student. And okay. so it was sort of a natural, it was a natural transition. <clears throat> and being a yoga student, you start to, you start to understand that there's like a trajectory of the class, you know, the way that the energy um, starts out in the yoga class, the way it builds, and then it comes down okay. for Shavasana. Um, very large amount of yoga classes sort of have this energetic arc. Okay. And so for me, uh, the playing follows that in a lot of ways. And, and a lot of it is just being in that room with the people and the teacher and whoever's um, leading the class and, and feeling that energy and then a lot and then some of it is you know from the years of my own practice um, yeah but it's not you know it's something that everybody approaches differently I just I think that you, you can't go probably into a yoga class and just like you know jump from like super intense uh, you know rhythmic playing right at the beginning and then you know, and then like play really soft and then go, you know, you, you got to sort of follow the class. Right. Yeah. I'm sure each teacher is probably a little different too, right? Yeah. Do definitely. they, do the teachers ever give you any kind of like instruction? Like, Hey, let's do it this way this time. Or can you try this or that sort of thing? It all depends on the teacher. You know, some, some teachers uh, really like to um, structure their class with a form that they follow. And so, you know, teachers that do that, Oftentimes, you'll talk to him beforehand um, and talk about how the class is going to go. And then other teachers are very free flowing and, and they're just kind of like, I trust you and yeah. you can follow my playing. And, and Cool. Hey, we got a question here. Let me let me see if it's a nice, legit question. <laughs> Oops. Oh, uh, it's, let's see. I can. Oh, Athena. It's Athena. Can you see it, Jeremy? I can see him. Yeah, I oh, can. Great. I can tell you when we got questions since you're all the way back there. But perfect. It just says um, she's thanking us that she got an email about this because she forgot that she oh. <laughs> she doesn't actually have a question. So okay. Athena. Thanks for tuning in, Athena. Thanks so much. She's always uh, asking us questions and having fun stuff on our on our videos. So it's good to hear from her. Okay. And she just bought a hand pan too, so she's probably raring to go and excited about it. And it's great. Nice. So cool. Um. Could you like just also the other thing, too, is like I frequently hear yoga, meditation, sound healing, those three kind of things. Um, yoga, obviously, is a physical activity. Uh, meditation to me is kind of like this umbrella for uh, some kind of relaxation kind of technique, uh, maybe not so physical, not like yoga. And then sound healing um, is also something different. It's kind of a different experience. It's not always composed of uh, some kind of yoga poses or any kind of exercise. So in your opinion, like, what are the differences between like playing a handpan for yoga versus sound healing versus like a meditation ceremony or something? Okay. Um, so, you know, a lot of times when I think about playing in a yoga class, there's a teacher that's leading the class. There's a lot of movement and, and things like that and the different poses and the asanas. So uh, playing in that, you're sort of following, you know, as we've been just talking yeah. recently recently following that energetic arc of the, uh, the class um, meditation you know there's a lot of different forms of meditation and you know for me personally uh, 
the meditation practice that I've followed is more of a breath meditation. So I wouldn't incorporate music in the meditation practice. Okay. I don't. I, I don't ever listen to music when I'm meditating. Got it. Okay. Um, but there are people, and I've played for meditations before, and there's people that uh, will meditate with music every time they meditate. So, um, but that generally, to me. If I think about playing for meditation, I'm thinking about a lot more like repetition and something that's more steady and constant versus um, following some sort of energetic flow or, um, you know, changing. I think if you're playing in a meditation and you're and you're changing it up too much, it's going to be a distraction. Right. It so, becomes a distraction. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, sound healing or like what? Uh, Nancy and I, uh, we call our sound journeys, is for me, um, I think we might do it a little different than most people that do sound sound healings, but uh, I think again, a, in a sound healing setting, there's a lot of um, this sort of like constant energy, it's more calm, um, okay. with maybe yeah. a few points throughout it that the energy might change to sort of... Uh, direct people's energy in a certain direction or take it in a certain direction yeah um but for us when we talk about like doing our sound journey it's more like um it's almost like a, a story like it you know people are coming in and they're getting quiet and they're uh laying down generally in our events <clears throat> and so we're like directing them on this inward journey. So that, that might be a very emotional experience or it might be, um, you know, some people might close their eyes and have a visual experience. And when we think of a journey, it's, it's like a, kind of like a hero's journey, you know, there's like different parts of that journey. So we would direct the energy in a way that would sort of take people, you know, different places rather than this constant energy yeah so uh there's one one part that we do in a lot of our sound journeys it's called the sacred mountain and, and in the sacred mountain the energy just builds and builds and builds and while that's building nancy's um guiding uh it's like a guided meditation sort of and she's talking them through with her voice and the person who's going on that journey gets to like this precipice or the cliff and they jump off and you know so the music sort of follows that and yeah and takes people um to that that peak i got guess. it and so so yeah there's you know that's just a different different artistic interpretations of it yeah so i've got two questions for you i want to ask them uh, at the same time so i don't forget the other one <laughs> but uh, okay. uh one of them is i want to hit on the, the 432 hertz question a lot of people have questions about 432 hertz and then uh, the other one is i know that you're a multi-instrumentalist so we were just talking about the journey, the sound journey you take people on with your uh, uh, girlfriend, Nancy. And uh, I wanted to know, like, do you use hand pan the whole time or do you incorporate it in certain sections and that sort of thing? Like, how do you blend it in with the other things that you're doing for that journey? Okay, so I'll touch on them in order you okay. uh, asked about 32 <laughs> hertz. Um, I'm probably not the person to to answer that entirely correctly because I don't really believe oh, perfect no stuff about I love hearing the opinion so it's, it's great <laughs> um but you know there's a lot of people that think that 432 hertz is a uh, very like healing frequency and um there's a lot of you know there's a little bit of conspiracy about 440 hertz in that in those circles of people that believe 432 hertz but really, you know, I made the decision early on that I was going to stick to 440 hertz with my instruments because I want to play with other people. Yeah. And the amount of people that you're going to find in, in life that have 432 hertz instruments uh, is much smaller than people with 440 hertz instruments. So yeah. that's, you know, that's why I stuck to that early on. You can change a guitar or any stringed instrument to 432 or you can tune a, a synthesizer or a keyboard right. to 432 but if I was gonna, um, you know, play hand pan with you today, and I have a 432 and you have a 440, or then we couldn't. Or if I had my didgeridoos, 
So I kind of had to stick to something early on that would allow me to build around that. So everything yeah. that we've got, all my didgeridoos, um, all my hand pans, all our crystal singing bowls, everything is tuned to 440. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because my experience with 432 is that uh, I've tuned several hand pans to, you know, 432 hertz. And for anybody out there that doesn't know what the heck we're talking about, <laughs> uh, 440 hertz is the amount of uh, beats per minute uh, that a frequency vibrates. I think it's A, A440. A uh, vibrates at 440 beats per minute. Or a second. Is it a second or a minute? Do you know the Jeremy? Cycles per second. Cycles so per like, second. That's what it is. If there's a line here, it's like how many times that sound wave right. passes that line in one second. That's right. So uh, so all you're doing is you're just kind of slowing down those cycles per second. So instead of 440 for that duration of time, you're going to get 432, which is just a slightly slower uh, frequency. And so my experience with it isn't so much of like a, um, like a drastic, oh my gosh, it's totally different experience. And my, my experience really is when I play the hand pan when it's 432, I, I just, my body, and I don't intentionally feel this way, it just kind of just feels like, like I just kind of limp, get limp a little bit. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but it's, it's a very strange experience because I, I can tell that I'm hearing something different, but it's, it's so subtle that you can't really put your finger on it sometimes, like what that difference is. Obviously, uh, when you play with other instruments, it is fairly apparent that it's not quite in tune with the other instruments that are 440, but yeah, it's strange. For, so my experience with that is just a very subtle experience, but maybe other people feel it in different ways. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, there's definitely a uh, different perception in the body and, and of course in our ears. Yeah, um, hey, can you read those comments that Athena has there? Yeah. So Athena, first, the second comment was uh, very interesting to think about hand pan during yoga. What a great idea. It sounds lovely. Um, and then the newest one was, yeah, did you reduce? Thanks for your input about 432 versus 440. She went with 440 because she didn't want to limit herself, but she finds 432 more relaxing physically. And oh, then, interesting. And then she wrote, yes, Dave's saying it. So, oh, yeah. look at that. You know, that <laughs> I, I find that deeper sounds to me are more relaxing. So, mm -hmm. you know, 432 versus 440, the 432 is a little bit deeper. Yeah, that's true. Um, and, you know, there's there's a lot of science behind both. And um, my, I really, you know, haven't dove into it a whole lot. My, my basic reason that I've gone with 440 is so that I can play with other musicians. Yeah. You know, I've, I've lived in, uh, you know, a lot of different countries around the world and I can't go to Africa and expect them that they're going to have 432 hertz <laughs> instruments or that's a good you know, point go to go yeah. to Indonesia and expect that their flutes are 432 you know right right um, so that's interesting cool well then let's follow up with that other question I was having because I know that you're a multi-instrumentalist and uh, I love that you do that by the way because um it's not hand pan all the time 100 percent it's like you break it up with different things right yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I just love that because it's kind of it's like an orchestrated way of thinking about the hand pan, and uh, so uh, when you're when you're orchestrating with the hand pan and using different instruments, uh, do you use it again like as more of the meditative sound, or do you use it more as an energy sound? Because you were talking about with uh, you and Nancy, you kind of create this this uh, cliff, and then they kind of fall off the cliff or whatever. Do you use the hand pan in that specific area of the of the experience, or I do? How, yeah, how, how does that work? Actually, so that one is a little bit more energetic hand pan song, and then uh, when they're actually going off the cliff, there's some silence, and then it comes in with the didgeridoo and the hand uh -huh. pan to like create that energy. Got it. You know, so the didgeridoo is uh, definitely used in that for energy and. Um, you know, the hand pan is definitely the focus and the center point of our sound journeys. Okay. Um, but all these other instruments float in and around throughout the experience. So she plays crystal singing bowls. I do the didgeridoo. Um, we have uh, five gongs that we use of various sizes. <clears throat> and um, the gongs, usually when we do those, they're by themselves. Uh, but everything else is played together. Look at my dad just chimed in. Nice. The sound, sound Journey workshops are incredible. Jeremy and Nancy are incredible. This is from their greatest fan who has traveled around the country to attend them. 
<laughs> ah, there you go. That's so, great. Yeah. Glad to hear from so, your dad. That's wonderful. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's come all the way out to Colorado with us to to help out um, at the Breckenridge Yoga Fest, and yeah. he's come down to Florida and come to our events, and uh, he's definitely come all over. That's awesome. Got to get get him to come to one of our retreats around the world. Yeah, man. Oh, speaking of around the world, I've known that you have traveled. So uh, one of the places I remember seeing on Facebook that you traveled was uh, Morocco. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Did you bring your hand pan with you or, or how did that work? Yeah, so that was, um, was that my second time to Morocco wow. personally? But that was uh, most recently Nancy and I went to Morocco for, I'd say six weeks maybe. Yeah. Um, before we went down into West Africa and um, definitely had the hand pan there. We led a yoga retreat. I lost a hand pan there. I got uh, a hand pan, pan stolen from me when we were there, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so I came back one short. But <clears throat> um, yeah, that was my second time to Morocco. My first time to Morocco, I also took a hand pan, and the one I had was very similar to uh, high jazz sort of Middle Eastern yeah. scales. So that was really cool. I spent some time living with a Moroccan family, and he taught me um, some Arabic music with him playing the oud yeah and me playing the hand pan so well it sounds great together that's huh? pretty cool one time the hand pan kept me out of jail in morocco so that was kind of wow a story. i got um, you got to give us a little bit of that story man that's a good story yeah. we uh we were driving to marrakesh from a city called esawira uh to pick up a friend at the airport and my friend's girlfriend actually and so we took our car there. Uh, we had a car that was owned by another friend that we were driving. Uh, we were doing a music project and we drove from Bulgaria all the way to Morocco. And we were gonna continue on into Mali uh, in West Africa, but that didn't happen for yeah. a number of reasons. But when we went on this trip to Marrakesh to the airport, we forgot to take the papers for the car. Ah. And um, so, when we were coming back to Esawira, we got stopped at a checkpoint. So, you know, we're, we're pretty lucky. We don't really have a lot of checkpoints in the U.S. Right. You know? um, but it's a common thing in Africa. Okay. We do have checkpoints in New Mexico and Arizona and like right. border states. But Yeah. Um, so we got stopped at a checkpoint, and, of course, we didn't have our papers, and that creates a really great situation for the police in those countries. They, you know, take try to take full advantage of that situation. Yeah. and. You know they're threatening uh with taking us to jail or you know we got to pay him a large money uh, neither of which we wanted to do and we didn't have a large amount of money to pay him anyways yeah and i was i was sitting in the back seat while my friend who was driving and his girlfriend were up in the front and the hand pan was next to me and just instinctively i grabbed the hand pan out of the car got out of the car went around to where the police officer was and I sat on the ground and just started playing and I just like looked at it and he was like okay you can go oh no no way that's amazing just, just like that yeah you know after they were telling us that you know they could take us to jail for the night and yeah. take the car and we just he's like just oh they're musicians it. you can go <laughs> yeah no that's wonderful do you think it was language. yeah would, do you have any idea why it affected him like that no you know uh it, this story is a little longer than I, I you know, I've sure. really gotten into, but we, we had the language barrier. You yeah. Know, he spoke Arabic and French and we spoke English and, um, you know, my friend's girlfriend spoke German, so we God. really couldn't talk to each yeah. other. Uh, for a brief moment, the police officer was talking to our friend who owned the car, who had the papers, uh, in, in our, uh, hotel in, in Esawera. But, uh, the phone died, so, you know, we couldn't talk anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the phone battery. And so I, I really don't know what it was, you know. We, we didn't, he didn't tell us why, or it, he just said he had enough English and said, okay, you can go. Right. Um, but I, I think, you know, in African cultures, music is a very respected uh, thing. Sure. It's integral in their culture, and it was maybe that, or it was maybe this mysterious instrument that he'd never seen. I'll, I'll never know. Too. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a good story, man. Oh, that's, I like that one. <laughs> that's memorable. All right, so you know what? Speaking of uh, music and... So we got uh, a couple more. Oh, oh go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. 
Oh, it's it's just comments. Um, so no questions. I was oh, just okay, got it. Over there, just fun comments. Comments cool. from Athena. Yeah, thanks, Athena. Um, so on the topic of music and all that sort of thing, I see some hand pans in the background there, and I believe uh, mm -hmm. there's somebody else there with you. His name is Parker Horsch. Correct. Yeah. And so you're doing a recording project. Uh, do you mind bring him on? Can you bring him on uh, and just talk a yeah. little bit about it? Yeah. Go ahead and come on in, Parker. Should he sit at the hand pans or uh, whatever he's comfortable with? We can see him in the back. He's got the nice bright blue shirt on there. I'll shift to the side here. Yeah. What's going on? I'm actually. How's it I'm going, Parker? Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, perfect. So, Parker, tell so us Parker, a little bit about the project about you're working the project on with Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah. So I've been uh, lucky enough to hang out here with Jeremy and Nancy uh, over the last year during during all of these lockdowns and to uh, put together my first solo album. Um, that's focused around the handpans, and I've got a bunch of friends and family members that are uh, featured on the album, playing all sorts of different instruments. So nice. Uh, I've been nice. In, been here for about four months, on and off, over the last year, uh, okay. working on okay. this, this project with these guys. So um, yeah, it's coming together. We're getting there. Yeah, it looks yeah, impressive. It looks the impressive setup you've the got, setup there. got there. Um, quick uh, question quick for the question. beginners: they're they're, they're always wondering about, about different kind of handpan hand scales. Uh, what uh, kind of scales kind of are you scale playing in front of you? I think you have three hand pans. Do you, you know the scale names of each one yeah, of them? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the three that I have here, this one in the center is a D Celtic. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and then over here to my left, I have an F Romanian Hijaz. Here I've got an A pygmy. <laughs> that one, that one goes up into the stratosphere. Yeah, yeah. There's all sorts of notes on it. These are yeah. all um, instruments built by uh, David Gallagher at, at Macau. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, Dave's yeah, yeah. great. He's on the Big great. Island. Oh yeah, he's great. Oh, yeah, he's great. Yeah, I'm going to try to switch over while you're talking to Parker. I'm going to try to switch to his microphones back. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Just a moment. Sure. sure. Testing, testing. Can you guys still hear me? Can't hear you. Can't hear you. No. No. Not hearing it. <laughs> uh oh, you froze. Did you freeze? No, you're okay. You're okay. But I can't hear you. Can't hear you. No. No. <laughs> okay, we'll go back to the original <laughs> right. microphone. Right. Cool, I like that. That was cool, fun. I like that. That was fun. Yeah. Real, wor real, real world, real audio world experience audio there. Experience. Well, Parker, would you, I haven't, or actually, let me get back on the scale question. So if you were playing on a street corner, uh, do you just take out one of those hand pans, uh, like randomly? You're like, oh, I think I'll play this one today. Or do you have a favorite? Like, is there one that's kind of your favorite hand pan? Oh man, I don't know. I don't know about a favorite. I think I definitely try to mix it up as often as I can. Okay. Um, okay. I think that there are different scales that, um, kind of draw uh, seem to draw people's attention more so than others okay um, yeah okay yeah but yeah i would say most of the time for performing in the street i would either use the celtic or the uh the a pygmy okay right the hijaz okay, is a right. little bit different or uh yeah yeah just, or sorry uh, the Roma what was it romanian hijaz is that what you call yeah, it romanian yeah. 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 yeah yeah so what so do you I, find I that's different find about that one, that one <laughs> sorry say that again <laughs> sorry say that again <laughs> Uh, I just don't find myself playing that one as often uh, when I play out on the street. So. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 I like I, I like the hijaz sound. It's, it's so, um, so uh, different than like uh, the than Western like sounds. Western sounds. You know, it's got that Middle Absolutely. Eastern sound. Middle Eastern it's so sound. cool. I just dig it so much. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a lot of fun to uh, put together with. Uh, you know, I've been playing percussion for most of my life, so um, incorporating it with a lot of hand percussion is always a lot of fun. Yeah. Hey, would you be interested hey, in being put on the spot for a second and playing second something, for playing something for us? Uh, yeah, I, I think I could do that for you. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, sure. That'd be awesome, not? please. That'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, let's see here.
That's awesome. That's gorgeous, man. Gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah, that's amazing. So I've got two questions for you. Yeah. So I didn't see you really hit the ding note on your Celtic minor that time that for that song. Did you use the ding note? Uh, yeah, just a little bit. Right in the beginning, I'm kind of switching between the F here and, and the D to get a little bit of F major to right. D minor. Right. So right at the beginning, I've got a little bit of a... Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah, I know. Yeah, but overall, I'm just kind of floating around around the ding and using more of the the melody. So yeah, it's because uh, by using the F uh, as the bass tone, like on the on the hijaz, it really gave it an uplifting, happy major sound, right? Yeah, yeah. So with the you know the Celtic not having the B flat either, uh, right? For a, for a Kurd, I'm I borrow the the F and the B flat from this Romanian a lot to add into the D minor to give me a little right uh, a little right. more variation a little a uh, couple extra options there so so quick question so, about quick music, question music now music so, now, so yeah, did you study did you music study before you got into like hand pans do you know about chords and that, 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 that sort of thing because some, some people approach hand pan without, without knowing anything about music and they're just they're, they're genius, genius players, players but they don't they don't know if it's f major or d minor they don't really know that sort of thing so like how do you go into producing the music that you create I have a very, very, very basic understanding of music theory. Okay. Um, okay. I would say handpan more than anything uh, has kind of kick-started that in me. Um, once I started to get more than one pan, I was really trying to figure out what other instruments I wanted to add into what I was doing. Um, and so I started to dive into it a little bit further. But I studied music um, most of my life. I took piano lessons as a really young kid from kindergarten to fourth grade. and. Um, bailed on that when you could pick an instrument in band I started playing the drums and yeah so my, I, I did the my same rhythmic, thing <laughs> yeah my uh, my rhythmic understanding is much stronger than my music theory but yeah, um, yeah. a couple of bass things you know I can I can kind of work my way around figuring out some different chords or um, you know little things here and there that are helpful every once in a while or to be able to play with a guitar player and to tell them, oh, I'm playing in D minor or, or whatever right. it is. But right. Right. Uh, most right. of it just comes from from listening to the instruments and finding melodies that uh, sound good to me. And then I, I go back through and try to figure out what it is that I'm actually playing. So, yeah. yeah. So it's a very intuitive very experience. Intuitive experience. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's a question for both of you, actually. So, Parker, when I saw you playing, you were doing a lot of the slap technique, right? A lot of that slapping to get the backbeat. Yeah. So you seem very comfortable with that. Jeremy, earlier you were telling me that you don't use a whole lot of extended techniques. You just like to play basic, kind of a basic handpan style. Do you use that that backbeat kind of slap in your playing as well? Not really. Okay. Um, you know, if I'm jamming with somebody or whatever, I might use it. Uh, if it's fitting, but uh, when I'm writing, I very rarely use that. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So everyone has their own style, so it's it's kind of fun talking, talking about it and finding out, out what people do. people do. Cool, Parker. How long did it take you to kind of develop that style of getting that backbeat so even and, and seamless? So I think you know having a percussive background was extremely helpful in that. I had a lot of the the muscle memory down to. Uh, different styles of hand percussion and it, it really came pretty easily for me to translate it to the hand pan yeah. Um, yeah. I would say within a, a few months of um, owning my first instrument I started to incorporate um, more groove based playing and, and dropping in backbeats and stuff but yeah. I think yeah. that's what makes um, 
you know, collaborating with other people, especially in the hand paint community, so um, inspiring is um, we all approach these instruments so differently. And, you know, for Jeremy and I to sit down together, uh, I learn something from him every time that we get together because his playing is so much different than mine. And his right. approach to right. the instrument is so much different. And yeah. Um, yeah. so, yeah, I think that um, no matter how long you've been playing or how long somebody else has been playing, um, you're always going to be able to learn something from one another, and that's what makes these so special. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Hey, thank you so hey, much, Parker. So much, that, was Parker. that was delightful. I really appreciate well, your really time on this. That was great. that was great. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me jump in for a minute. I you're, appreciate you guys. You're welcome. This you're is welcome. terrific. <laughs> Jeremy, uh, hey, uh, I just want to say uh, thank you. I think we can pretty you. much uh, wrap it up right now because right was, that was a delightful yeah. little yeah. musical little yeah. ending of this yeah. all, uh, yeah. just this uh, discussion. discussion. So I don't know if there's any other comments. It looks like people are just saying that the music was beautiful and they just really enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, so the uh, yeah. New, yeah. newest comments are uh, from Saggio. Okay. Uh, Saggio oh, yeah. Saggio said, oh, very nice, Parker. So, uh, actually, so Saggio is like, uh, we were talking about sound healing earlier. Um, the first time I ever went to, like, somebody else playing sort of a sound healing or a sound bath or type experience was Saggio and his wife at their house, and they had already at that time been doing it for years yeah i've met saggio at a house in the desert so yeah i met saggio um, at the Athena fantasia said, beautiful and then uh i don't know how to pronounce your name but yoga um kung tien said that's so beautiful yeah absolutely absolutely so thanks for everybody that tuned in today, by the way. Thanks for watching. It's a joy to see the comments. I really enjoy the comments that you guys made, and I'm sure Jeremy enjoyed them as well. Um, let's just wrap it up and say thank you, Jeremy. You're wonderful. I really appreciate your time and energy. And by the way, everybody, Jeremy did a really nice thing for me recently. Uh, my little sound device that attaches to my computer wasn't working. I dropped it, and the little power supply thing on the back broke. And so he said, oh, I think I can fix that for you. So I sent it off to him, and he uh, glued it back in and sent it back in, and I, it works again. So <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. That was super sweet. Thanks for having me. We had two questions just pop in. Oh, okay, great. And I'd like to answer that. So, yeah. Um, Lisa Danovich said, why and how do you use multiple pans? Ah. Um, so, you know, both Parker and I both played multiple pans, so um, I can probably chime in my perspective here. Uh having multiple hand pans just opens up a whole new frontier with uh, hand pan playing and it allows you to sort of create different sounds and, and melodies that you would not have on one instrument otherwise and even though you could build an instrument that has you know 20 notes on it and notes on the top and bottom it's a different experience to have them to your side and and um i just i personally like the way that it feels to play multiple instruments as well as um allowing you know those new possibilities over just getting stuck with the one instrument for time um but it allows you to play in different keys or different musical scales and uh, different things like that yeah and then um, maria said how do we find out about sound journey workshops so um, nancy and i's sound journeys uh, we go by the name settle into stillness um, so our sound journey uh, workshops are on our website at um, settleintostillness.com. Uh, right now, you know, because of COVID, we haven't been touring. Um, but starting next month, we have some workshops in Michigan. And then, you know, as time goes on, we'll get back around the country again. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm sure there's some people that are local to you that do them. Um, unfortunately, I don't know where you're at, Maria. Um, or I'd recommend some people that I might know. And then Lisa said again, what is the key to mixing pans with other instruments or styles of music? Um, any experience with flamenco? So I know there are hand pan players that play music with uh, flamenco players, mm -hmm. but yeah. that is yeah. not me. I have zero flamenco background, um, except for uh, learning a little bit of rasteos. Um, with the guitar in a classical guitar class I took in college. That's about about it. But mixing pans with other instruments or styles of music, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. I think that the hand pan can fit with any style of music. Um, it really depends on who the artist is and what you're inspired by. So, um, you know, you got to 
we talked about 432 and 440 earlier. Um, you know, you got to match your your tuning, and then you got to match your keys uh, together, and you know, from there you can go wild with it. And um, you know, I I have a band with uh, two Australian musicians and a Finnish musician called Eight Hands of Sound, and you know, on there we use everything from uh, synthesizers, hand pans, piano, guitar flutes, clarinets, uh, singing, ethnic instruments, uh, anything that we had at our disposal, we used it, drums, percussion, it's kind of like Parker's album here that we're working on, um, has everything from like heavy metal influence to um, just like acoustic hand pan stuff, and so um, if you like a certain style of music, you can fit the hand pan in it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the, absolutely. It's the the world is your world oyster. Is your yeah. yeah. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks once for again, me and thanks for having Parker. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank, Thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy. It's a pleasure talking, talking with you at length, at length, finally. Finally. Yes. And, uh, and uh, well, hopefully we'll see you if you in the future in the next time. Next time. Definitely. Awesome. Well, have a wonderful yeah. evening. You're out in Michigan, yeah. I know, so yeah. maybe the sun is not quite setting yet. But enjoy the evening. And I wish you well. And thank you again. Thank you again. All right. Thanks. All right, everybody. All right, everybody. Well, I'm, uh, I'm uh, working the scenes all by myself today. Daniel's not here helping me with the uh, background yeah, stuff, so I get to use the mouse right, right here and turn here off our YouTube right <laughs> session. So, so let's see if I can do it. <laughs> Have a good one, everybody. Thank you so much.